Hello. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Cloud English Podcast. My name is Luke. It is February 25th, 2011. I sure hope the world doesn't end next year. That would be bad news. Well, anyway, welcome. We have a lot of things to talk about. Today, we are going to be working on English for debate. Yes, English for debate. Now, I think when we think of debate, what we, why did I say debate? Is that how I talk? I don't usually say that like that. <laughs> debate, debate. Sorry, I, I became a bro there for a second. So what was I saying? When we think of debate, I think we often think of a formal debate setting, perhaps a political debate, or maybe a presidential debate, uh, if you watch that sort of thing. Or maybe you think of a debate team, a competitive debate. Well, I want us to be thinking about it much more generally today. Debate as in you need to present ideas to other people in a way which is persuasive to them or people who are listening. Now that covers a pretty wide range of activities in daily life and work from having a discussion with family members, friends, convincing them that where, where you would like to travel is the right place to travel, for example, to do a callback to last week's episode, perhaps at work, when you feel very strongly about something, you've made a conclusion and it is based on data, and you believe that the data is telling you something, pointing at a particular direction, somehow related to your job. And you need to get this message across in a way which other people find compelling, persuasive. Well, how do we do this? How do we do this in a way which is natural? How do we do this in a way which actually persuades people? I, <laughs> in general, I'm kind of skeptical that you can debate someone into changing a belief. So if it's a belief they have about how the world works, if it's a belief that they have about maybe their lives, something they think is right or wrong, I'm a little bit cynical about being able to do that, to successfully use arguments and reason to get someone to change their position. I, I really think the value of debate is in simply being able to express yourself clearly, but also when there is a situation in which the outcome is unknown or something is undecided, then debate becomes very useful, right? You're probably not going to change anyone's mind if their mind is made up, as we say. But you might change someone's mind whose mind is not made up. Or when a direction, strategic direction, has not been decided yet. This is where debate really comes in. This is when it becomes really important. Okay, so we'll get to a few things. Of course, I have some language to share with you, some words, some phrases, all of the good stuff. All the juicy stuff. Okay, right off the top of the show, though, a few things, if you haven't done so already. I would sincerely appreciate if you would hit the like button on this, wherever you see it, if there's a way to do that. Subscribe or follow, however you can do that. This is a meaningful way to support me and the show. If you like it, if you get value out of it, you don't have to give me any of your money. But I would appreciate if you would show support uh, using buttons. <laughs> like and subscribe. If you're listening, then there's a way to do that wherever you're listening, whether it's on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or whatever. But uh, if you are listening and you want to watch, you can do so on YouTube. 
And if you're watching and you want to listen sometimes, and, and no, uh, no judgment from me if that's what you choose. I like to listen as well. Well, then you can do that wherever you get your podcasts. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, uh, wherever, you know. Although I will admit there is, a, there is an unfortunate delay between uh, the actual live, because these are recorded live, this is live right now, and uh, the audio release, and I aim to make that timeline shorter. So I will work on that. Apologies to the audio listeners. I care about you. I respect you. I appreciate you. And, um, you know, apply pressure. Give me some pressure. Yell at me. Find me where I am and yell at me. Well, I mean, find me online. Yell at me on the Internet about it. Uh, let's see. If you generally pay attention to courses that I release, there should be one coming out in several days. This is a very unique course about American culture. I'm pretty excited about it. Also, also unsure what the reaction will be because it's totally different from the other types of courses that I have put out in the past. So look out for that. If you would like to get access to uh, the courses that are on the website, you can do that with a monthly membership. I recently added four new courses. And I com and the I combined the idioms courses into one course. So before those were separated out as four separate courses, and now they're combined into a single course. All of the same lessons, all of the same content. It's just more condensed, um, and so you get access to that. It's I, I believe it's something like eighty hours. I don't know exactly. It's a lot of content uh, that I've spent a lot of time on. So. Check that out. You can get a 30% discount. 30% discount in the links in the description. Okay? Okay. Okay. Uh, so let's get into it. Let me take a sip of tea. And to those watching, I'd like to apologize for the, my hair. Um... I've I've said this many times, but I get that I'm looking. I'm looking like this. I'm looking at myself. Okay. My hair doesn't grow in a cool way. When it grows, it grows in the dumbest way possible. So I get these two poofs right here. These side poofs, I call them. I get these side poofs, and I have to get a haircut every three weeks. And these side poofs just grow like crazy, and uh, it's pretty stupid looking but um, there's nothing I can do about it I need to get a haircut and I apologize so maybe you know just listen don't don't look don't watch close your eyes <laughs> close your eyes everyone starting right now from now on everyone who is watching on YouTube or Facebook listen only keep your eyes closed okay thank you I appreciate that all right, anything else? Uh, yeah, you can join the Discord, that's free. Um, so let's get into the stuff. Let's talk about being persuasive. Being persuasive. Now, what does that mean to be persuasive? Well, part of that is the actual thing that you say, right? Your thoughts. If someone is not sure what they believe or what they think or they're undecided. You being persuasive is putting forward your idea. That's simple enough, right? However, there's more to it than that. Because if you just say, well, I think that we should go to Barbados. <laughs> well, okay, why? And why did you say it like that? Are you okay? Do you need to go to the hospital? Are you having an allergic reaction? Are you going into anaphylactic shock? What's happening? I think it's even more important these days to put emphasis on how we present opinions, especially when we would like to be persuasive. So 
what I'm going to talk about is the presentation part of that. The how, not the what. The what is your opinion. Let's put that to one side. How do you speak in a way that makes other people want to listen, that is persuasive, that is interesting, that really makes people think, here's a person who's thought carefully about what they think, and it makes sense to me, right? Again, part of that is the opinion itself, and part of that is the presentation of that opinion. So, with all that said, here are some, some tips that work for me, someone who spends a lot of time talking to people on camera, doing courses, all of the things that I do. I'm doing all of these things right now, or well, most of them, right? Well, the first one is to slow down. And this is easier said than done because when we're trying to explain something to people, what we tend to do is put, we tend to put our judging brain onto them. That means we tend to have perfect knowledge of what our flaws are. And when we think about what other people think about us, we project onto them all of that knowledge about our weaknesses. Actually, they don't have all of that. And so that can make us kind of nervous. Oh, they want me to stop talking. They're judging me. I'm being judged. I'm being criticized. I don't even know what I'm being criticized for. This causes people to rush through what they want to say. This causes people to stumble over their words. It causes people to use a lot of thinking words and just generally to sound less articulate. So, slow down. You have to really get in the habit of doing it deliberately. Slow down your speech. It is totally okay to do that. And it's better to leave a pause instead of stumbling over a word, instead of using a lot of, unlike, 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 a lot of those words, right? So that's the second point is try to avoid using words that you don't mean to use, including thinking words. Thinking words may include um, uh, like, and um, and we all use them. There's no avoiding thinking words. Everyone uses thinking words sometimes. But if you want to be very persuasive, you want to try to reduce those and that combined with slowing down is going to be a huge improvement when you're explaining yourself, when you're expressing an opinion. At work, when you're trying to get a point across clearly to your colleagues, you want them to listen. You want them to say, wow, yes, good point. Well, if you're stumbling over yourself and you're, what comes out of your mouth sounds like, you know, verbal Potpourri, I don't know what's the right thing to say that comes out of someone's mouth that would be confusing. Verbal slop, that's pretty good, right? Then the point will be missed. But if it's clear because it's slow and deliberate and there aren't a lot of random words thrown in there, it's going to be more persuasive, okay? And so to do that, don't fear pauses. That's part of slowing down. Do not be afraid to pause and collect your thoughts, even if there are a hundred people looking at you. Make them wait. Make them listen to you, not do anything for one second. What's wrong with that, right? And you have to get in the habit of that. You have to get used to that feeling. It's very uncomfortable. It's not a natural thing. If you have many people looking at you, even if it's five people looking at you in a meeting, what a what a tense feeling. So your stomach tightens and your throat tightens and you start saying things you don't want to say, right? The next one I think is extremely important, right? So we're not, we're, we're, we're not fearing pauses. We're only using words that we want to use. We're slowing down. But the other thing is to always use an outline. Always use an outline. 
you don't have to write down an outline. It doesn't have to be a detailed outline. It can be a very simple outline. All you have to do is have some structure to your thoughts. Now, why does that matter? Well, most of us, when we're just talking, we tend to wander here and there. And the result of that is sometimes what we say can be a little bit confusing. People can get lost because we say a side point or an anecdote, and then we don't come back to the original point. After the anecdote, we're now making a different point, and so that can be confusing. This is natural, you know, human speech. But if you want to really be persuasive, it is a good idea to organize what you're saying. A simple way to do that is to write it down, of course, but there's not always time to write something down. When someone is asking you a question live in the moment, you don't always have time to write down three bullet points, the three things that you think, right? And so you can learn to do this in your head. I'm doing it right now. Hmm, hello, hello things I'm saying. It's in there because I have a technique for doing it. Everyone has a technique. If you don't, you can find one. But when you do this, when you outline, the great thing about it is that you don't get lost. You, ha you have a clear structure. I'm going to say this, and then this, and then this. And once I've said this, and this, and this, I will stop saying things. I'm not going to wander around spewing, what's the word that I chose? Verbal slop. That was the word I used, right? I'm going to follow a structure. People can feel that structure. They can follow along with what you're saying. They might nod along as you're talking. And then when you stop talking, they say, wow, that makes sense, right? Because you thought about it. And again, you can do that in your head. And by the way, it gives you a sense of confidence to not be struggling to think of what you're going to say, because you already know, because you have an outline, and instead focus on how to say it, focus on slowing down, focus on being clear, right? You don't have to think about everything, especially as an English learner, as a non-native English speaker. It's even more stressful because you're thinking about what you're saying. You're thinking about how to say it. You're thinking about your grammar, your, your pronunciation. You're thinking about so many things that it gets harder and harder in these types of situations, especially work-related situations, right? Okay, so that's half the battle, or maybe more than half. That's a huge part of it, being organized and slowing down, allowing yourself to pause and avoiding random words that you don't mean to say. But to get there, it's not just a matter of doink, deciding, ah, <laughs> right? To get there, you have to practice. So this is where you need to make a plan. Build a plan for yourself to work on your speaking skills, your presentation skills, your ability to explain things, right? Give yourself a daily challenge. Practice talking with ChatGPT live. It's a, a great way to practice. There's so many ways to do it. Record yourself just on video, answering a challenging question, an opinion question every day, and then watch that back. Might be painful to do so, but that's a very good way to practice. When you do this, as you do this, what you'll start to notice is you, you start to gain confidence, but you also start to notice what things that you do naturally that you like and what things that you do naturally that you don't really like. And it may be speech related or it may be your facial expression. It may be your choice of words, right? You'll start to identify these things. I never knew I said that. I, actually, that's pretty good that I do that. I have, uh, I think I have a pretty good sense of humor. Sometimes I add a little joke and I just naturally do that. I should do more of that. That's good. Right? And so what, you, what, what starts to happen as you practice is you start to find your voice. This is your voice. Your voice is the unique 
thing that you have as an agent in the world, rather an agent who can communicate in the world. The voice is the one that only you have, that is unique to you. And if you don't practice this, if you haven't practiced it, you may not, you, you may not have found yours. When you find it, you are basically building confidence around a style that is uniquely you and represents you, right? And we always continue to work on this over time, but it really is a matter of practicing, giving yourself feedback until you kind of naturally get to this place where well, this is kind of my style and you'll know it. You'll know it when you see it. Trust me, you will know it, but it's a matter of practice. You have to practice a lot. Now, finally, I did say this a little bit, but I'll just mention it because I want it to be I want it to be the point I leave you with, right? We've talked about how we can slow down. We've talked about avoiding words you don't mean, about not fearing pauses, about using outlines even if they're in your head, about finding your voice, right? Which means really being authentic. Find your authentic self, your authentic communication style, right? The last thing that I want you to remember is when you're trying to explain something to people, we can get this feeling that I'm not saying enough. I need to explain more. Maybe that thing I said wasn't clear enough. Uh, this could be the, thing, the third thing I said could have been better. I'm going to go back and I'm going to say it a different way. No, if you're confident and you feel like you've explained it fully, know when to stop. So when you're done saying what you want to say, stop. You won't have more impact because you keep trying to say it in different ways. If you really want to have an impact, keep it simple, say what you want to say, and then stop. Okay? So good luck with that. As you work to find your voice, your authentic speaking style, to practice being more persuasive. You have to practice. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments. If you haven't done so already, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe and get a free course in the links in the description. All right. Okay. Hopefully that helps. We're going to get to some phrases for debate as well, which I think will be interesting. I hope. I see some people um, having a bit of a disagreement in in um, on Twitch. I sometimes forget that I'm streaming on Twitch, honestly. It just does that automatically. I don't know. I, I don't spend a lot of time on Twitch, so I don't know how it, how it works exactly. I mean, welcome, of course. But I always just kind of thought Twitch was more for talking about, for the, for the um, just chatting, kind of talking about random stuff. I don't know. I'm not an expert. Hisham, one package says, thank you, Luck, so much. I'm watching your lessons on Skillshare, and they are quite useful. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Fantastic. Enjoy. New one going up very soon. Keep an eye out for the new one. Should be up in two days, I think. I hope. What can I do if I hate listening to my voice? This is actually a fantastic question from Camille. I'm going to actually pop this one up there if you don't mind. So Camille says, what can I do if I hate listening to my voice? 
And I think it's a good question, but the answer is probably easier than you think. Mm, simpler than you think, not necessarily easier than you think, right? Let's try to come up with an example that's similar to make it clear, right? So what is something that is uncomfortable because you're not used to it or you haven't done it? Well, I remember in my first few jobs when I was in my teens and early 20s, one was the pizza place and uh, coffee shop, the day before I would start working at that job, I would get really nervous, right? And I think I was nervous just because I didn't have a lot of experience. I didn't know if I would fail or succeed. Uh, but then after a while, I kind of got used to it. And then in general, I kind of got used to, for later jobs, what it felt like to start a new job. And so I stopped feeling nervous before, before those jobs, right? Uh, I don't remember how many I had, but it was really just the first few. And so there's something about doing stuff for a while that helps you to kind of get used to it. To get used to it is a matter of doing it, right? A matter of doing it a lot, of repetition, of pushing through some kind of, I don't want to say innocence, let's say some lack of experience. Now for that example that I told about my first few jobs, I think that probably is familiar to, to most of you, right? Yeah, that makes sense. And so after you do a few, you get used to it. Uh, you have a few jobs. You kind of get the idea of what it's like to have a job over time. It just becomes natural. Well, that's true for so many things. It's true for driving. It's true for learning a new skill, right? It's true for maybe going to another country or traveling. First time you travel, you feel nervous, right? I remember the first time I really left home to move somewhere on my own. I moved to New York City. And on, on the surface, I didn't feel nervous. But the night before I left, my whole body started shaking. I started having muscle spasms. And my legs got weak my body was reacting to some sort of stress or fear that I wasn't really feeling consciously. And I think it was because I was doing something for the first time. I, I didn't have much experience. But with experience comes confidence and comfort. And that comfort part is the key to the hate listening to yourself thing. Trust me. If you put in, I don't know, let's say, I would say 30 hours. If you put in 30 hours of, let me write this in a different place, 30 hours of talking in front of others, in a way that is recorded, whether that's videos or whatever. Uh, if you do that for 30 hours, I think you'll, you'll start to get over it and you won't feel it anymore. It's just a matter of doing a lot of it. It has to be recorded, right? Because the thing that you don't like is listening to yourself. So if you're practicing speaking, a great way to practice is to record yourself. If you do that and you do it for, I would say, this much, I mean, it's just a general number, uh, by then you will it will be like nothing. I mean, I have to watch so many hours of myself for courses and uh, just everything. To me now, my voice in my head, the way that I think I sound, sounds exactly the same 
as the way I sound when I hear a recording of myself. The two have kind of synchronized because I've heard myself so much that I think they've just kind of aligned and I've done it so much that I've just become comfortable with it. I feel nothing when I hear myself speak. So long answer to uh, to your question, but I think really you just need to do a lot of it. Do a lot of it. If you're not sure how to do something, do a lot of it. Okay. Uh, how can I increase my listening skills? As for a beginner, any movie recommendations maybe? It's not about the specific movie recommendation that I would give you that would suddenly help you improve your, you know, your um, your English listening or anything. It's There's often no magic bullet. Uh, the, 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 the phrase we use is a, a uh, magic bullet. Usually there isn't one. Usually it's time. It's consistency. It's habits. It's uh, not doing the wrong things, of course, but it's challenging yourself. It's not doing stuff that's too easy, right? It's really um, more about how often you watch movies and how you do it and making sure that what you watch is actually a little bit difficult for you. For example, you know, if you're watching, I don't know what would be really easy, documentaries and David Attenborough is very easy for you to understand because he's so well-spoken, then you should probably challenge yourself with some TV shows that have a lot of colloquialisms, idioms, phrases, slang, that will push you to really train your ears. I would also recommend that you at least once try watching an episode of a TV show without subtitles, especially without subtitles in your language. But without subtitles, period, can really challenge you. Watch that episode a couple times. See if you can hear more each time that you watch it. Take notes. And then, after you've tried a couple times, this is your listening practice episode, the one that really challenges you, then turn on the English subtitles and see how much you actually got, right? So, no magic bullet there. All right. We're going to get to some debate language, if that's okay. If that's all right. I'm going to... Often a difficult thing, TV show without subtitle. Yeah, of course. It should be difficult. If it's too difficult, that's not good. But if it's pretty difficult, then that's good. Pretty difficult is better than not difficult at all. But... Unbelievably difficult is not good. Speaking of pauses, I'm taking a sip of tea. By the way, I started using this thing. I've never actually had a thermos before. And I started using this to refill my hot beverages. That's what that sound is, by the way. Just to be clear, I'm refilling my tea. Well, uh, it's so good at holding temperature. One time I left it in my office, I came back to my office the next day and thought, I wonder if it's still warm. I poured some tea. And it wasn't just warm, it was too hot to drink 24 hours later. That's crazy. Very good at holding temperature. Amazing. All right. Let us go to the thing. Johanna said, I love the way you speak. I'm a para-educator, and I encourage the students to speak with confidence. That's great. Fantastic. Good. 
All right, let's move on to some debate language. Phrases for debate. No? There we go. There we go. That's better. All right. Think what you will about about Donald Trump. His the gifs of Trump are you have to admit great. I I'm a fan of the of the gifs. All right. Whether you are debating someone for the sake of debating or you're trying to persuade colleagues of something very important, a strategy, for example, that you believe is right, no matter what you're doing, if you're trying to make another person see things your way and they don't agree, and they may be trying to make you see things their way, you're in a debate, okay? And so I want to share with you a few useful phrases that you can use when you are in, when you find yourself in a debate. Now, some of these will be a little formal for a casual situation. So we'll talk about a few variations as well. But the idea behind them, I think, is really good because sometimes when you disagree, you don't want to be too straight. You don't want to say, no, that's wrong, idiot. Uh, usually that will make the other person shut down and they will not really listen to what you're saying. So knowing how to disagree, knowing how to get more information, put your point across. So we're just going to look at a, a group of a, few, uh, of a few phrases, okay? First, for agreement. Now, why would we want to agree. Well, we might want to agree when we see part of what another person said as true or right or correct, but maybe we need to add more information or we may need to uh, say that's true, but right. We need to agree and disagree. And it can also be a good way to get the other person to feel good. OK, they agree with one thing I said. And they may be more likely to listen to you if you agree and then disagree. I like to do that personally. I find it to be an effective technique. I'm looking down here. I'm looking at this text. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm reading here, if that's okay. I hope that's okay. I hope that's all right. All right, so how do we add to an argument? I agree with you on that point, and I'd like to add. I agree with you on the importance of renewable energy. And I'd like to add that it also creates new job opportunities. Now, this is not first agreeing and then disagreeing, but you could do the same thing here. I agree with you, for example, here, I agree with you on the importance of renewable energy. energy. And then instead of and, you would say, but I'd like to mention that. And then you would say a point against what they say, right? How about strengthening a point? Exactly. And furthermore, now furthermore is a little formal for some situations. If you're casually debating colleagues, furthermore is probably too formal. However, if you're in a, I don't know, boardroom environment or this is a, a big important meeting, there's nothing wrong with saying furthermore. Just know that it is somewhat formal. Exactly. So exactly is the agreement. And furthermore, studies have shown that early education can significantly impact a child's future success. So this is where maybe it's a two on two debate where I'm on the same side as this person here and we're debating two other people and I'm agreeing with somebody on my side and I want to add strength to their point because they said that thing that I agree with that's right exactly yes and furthermore 
Furthermore, I'm adding an additional point. Can be very useful. Now, if you don't want to have the formality of furthermore, what do you say? Exactly. And <laughs> just don't say furthermore. So if you want to make it more casual, just just don't say it. Exactly. And studies have shown that early education can significantly impact a child's future success. By the way, these are just example arguments uh, for debates. So don't pay too much attention to the content here, if you please. These are not my real opinions necessarily. Education, um, no, I'm against education. I actually don't think children should be educated. Ah, expanding. How do we expand? That means to add, to add more information or to make it broader. Not only do I agree, but I also think. So I think what you're saying is right, right? But I don't think you're going far enough with it. I think you need to make it even bigger. Not only do I agree that public parks enhance community life, but I also think they contribute to environmental well-being. Now, this could be a way to disagree with someone, in fact, because maybe you think that while they're right in their opinions, they're wrong in that their focus is not right. Maybe their focus is too small, right? This would be maybe, you know, I think that that uh, it's not just that parks are important, but that they should they should inc they should have double the budgets they currently have. That's how important they have. Not only do I agree that public park parks enhance community life, I think that they should be considered a part of maybe um, uh, some sort of spending program, for example, that. This person maybe doesn't think. I think they should be a, a, a large part of the city's budget. I should. I think they should be fifty percent of the city's budget for the year, <laughs> something like that. I'm going even further with it. So there, it's not exactly disagreement, but it could be in them having a small and narrow view, and me feeling that it should be broader and bigger or more in some way. Now, how about? Disagreement. How do we disagree? We might want to do that polite, uh, in a polite way, politely. We might want to do it more directly. We might want to do what I said before, where we say that something is either true or that we can understand it clearly, but that we don't have the same view. So let's look at a few phrases we can use here. I see your point, but I disagree because, OK, this is good. Sometimes this could be considered too direct. I see your point is not saying I agree with what you're saying. I see your point means what you said makes sense to me. It's clear to me. So I'm not agreeing. There I'm just kind of recognizing that what you said makes sense. Okay? I see your point, but digital books about digital books being convenient, but I disagree because they lack the tactile experience of physical books. Now, this is just an ordinary conversation. We're not having a major debate, but we disagree on the experience of books, right? You think uh, audiobooks are great, and you think having a Kindle is great. Well, I see what you're saying. I understand it's convenient, but I would rather have a physical book because there's something tactile about that, the smell, the taste, right? <laughs> Am I the only one who who licks their books before they read them? I can't be the only one. But I and now I want to mention one thing on this one. I disagree because that could be too strong. If you wanted to soften it, you could say I don't quite agree. That would be okay. Or you could say but I don't see it that way. I don't quite see it that way. That might be better. This is fine. It just might be a little bit direct. Now, this is one of my favorites to use when I'm in a disagreement with someone. While that may be true, I believe. So this is a great way to say what you're saying is true and then kind of go over that with another point. Or maybe saying, again, that's a very small view and you're not looking at the big picture or something like that. While that may, uh, while it may, whoa, 
And this is slightly awkward. I would say, while it may be true that, while that may be true that urban areas, yeah, I would say we could use, while it may be true that urban areas. Let's mentally replace that with it. While it may be true that urban areas offer more job, job opportunities, I believe rural areas offer a better quality of life, okay? So that's a really useful one. And again, it's okay to use that, but I would recommend using it instead of that here. While it may be true. You would use while that may be true if you don't say what it is, right? So uh, while that may be true, you just said that urban areas offer more job opportunities. I don't repeat what you said. While that may be true, and then I believe rural areas offer a better quality of life. Now, if I want to say what you said, I want to repeat it, then I should use it. While it may be true that urban areas offer more job opportunities. One reason to possibly say what they said would be to show them that you're listening, to show them that you're paying attention. Hmm, yes, I see. Uh, yeah, well, okay, well, it may be true that, and then say exactly what they said or rephrase it in your own words. You're showing them I'm listening to you. Okay, understanding yet disagreeing. I understand where you're coming from, however. Where you're coming from? <laughs> what do you mean? This phrase, I understand where you're coming from, is often about your motivation, your general idea, uh, the attitude behind what you're saying, that what you're saying has understandable uh, emotions connected to it, right? So maybe, you know, someone says, I think that we should give all homeless people $5,000 to get their lives together, right? And so you're thinking there, if we give them that much money, they'll fix their lives, right? And in me saying, I understand where you're coming from means, well, I think you saying that is coming from a place in your heart of compassion. I only disagree with it because I don't think that's a good solution. Maybe I happen to know that a lot of people who are homeless in a certain place are homeless because of addiction. And it seems pretty clear to me that if they have $5,000 because they have addictions that they may use that on their addictions rather than using that to improve their lives. So I see where you're coming from with your point, but I don't agree, right? I understand where you're coming from with the need for economic growth. However, we must also consider the environmental impacts, right? So yes, we need to grow, we need to expand, but we have to do that while considering the impact on the environment. Okay, so let's move on to talk about different perspectives, okay? So we've explored how to agree and disagree. Those are a big part of having a debate or a disagreement with someone when we're trying to persuade them. But what about different perspectives? How can we express uncertainty? I, I don't maybe get the idea, and so I need to understand it maybe better before I say what I think. Could you explain your viewpoint on the role of government in healthcare? Could you explain your viewpoint on something? Could you explain your view on that? Could you explain your opinion? View, opinion, thoughts. If you wanted to say this more casually, could you say what you mean by... So you said something. I don't know what you mean by that, right? Uh, could you explain what you mean by that thing you said, right? So maybe the role of government in healthcare. Can you explain what you mean by the role of government in healthcare? I need further clarification. I need elaboration. I need more detail from you. Once I have more information, once I'm sure I understand what you're talking about, then I will give my view. Then I will agree or disagree, okay? Clarification means something is not clear. It needs more detail again, uh, or maybe there's some detail, but I need more, okay? It's my understanding that, do you agree? Okay, this is where we would say what we think the other person might be saying, right? Or what we think is true about an issue. 
right? And then the other person can can say, yeah, that's what I think, or mm, not quite, okay? It's my understanding that renewable energy sources are becoming more cost effective. Do you agree with that? So I'm assuming what you might think based on what I know, right? And then that helps me get more information from you, right? Now you could say if you're trying to uh, if you're trying to get them to explain more about their view, you might say, for example, um, well, what I'm understanding is, so instead of it's my understanding, what I'm understanding, I am understanding in this conversation, what I'm understanding is that you believe we should increase the budget for public parks significantly. Do you agree with that? Or is that right? Right. So that would be getting someone to give a simple answer when maybe they've said a lot. Right. I'm trying to maybe get them to give me more or give me a clear statement or give me a clear yes or no. Right. What I'm understanding is. Right. Or another good one, by the way, I, while I'm on the topic, I think you're saying that's a really good one. I forgot I should have put that one in here. I think you're saying that you want public parks in the city to have basically double the budget that they currently have. Is that right? Am I correct? And then they'll say, yes, that's right. That's what I think. Or they'll say, no, not exactly. And then they'll explain more. Right. So it's a great, these, these kinds of phrases are really good. It's my understanding. I am understanding. I think you're saying that, right? It seems like, I keep coming up with more. It seems like you're saying, and then do you agree? Is that right? Is that correct, right? Or am I wrong? Am I wrong? That's another good one. Am I wrong? Uh, no, you're not wrong. Oh, okay, hmm, okay. Encouraging consideration. Perhaps we should consider. This would be asking someone to look at something else. Think about this, think about that, think about this, think about that. You're not thinking about something that you should be thinking about. Perhaps we should consider, perhaps we should consider the long-term benefits of investing in education over immediate economic gains. So you keep talking to me about gains, 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 <laughs> obsessed with gains. You're a gains, a gains freak. Well, you know, that's very short term. Maybe we should consider that by spending more on education, we have long-term benefits that don't make sense in the short term, but in the long term, uh, maybe more spending in education could have an outsized impact. Oh, okay, okay, so this is a really good one. Perhaps we should consider, maybe we should consider, you can also say instead of consider, think about, maybe we could think about, right? It's a great way to bring it up or raise something else to point your finger at another thing in a very, I would say, gentle way, okay? Last one that we're going to talk about is how we have some civility, how we, how we show respect to other people when we're debating with them, how we get across the idea that we're open-minded. I'm not just throwing my opinion out there and forcing everyone to agree with me. I, I, I'm willing to change my mind here, right? I respect your opinion, but that's pretty straightforward, right? It's a great way to disagree. Right? I respect your opinion on immigration, but I think there are aspects you might not have considered. Okay, so I think you're missing something. I think your view is uninformed. Well, how would it be if I said, you are, you are uninformed, dum-dum? <laughs> how, how likely are they to feel respected and to listen to what I'm about to say? Not very likely. So, I respect your opinion. I really respect your maybe sincerity. I really appreciate uh, where you're coming from. Again, you could use where you're coming from there. I see where you're coming from, right? All of these are okay. I respect your opinion is a great one. Let's agree to disagree. So this is when we can't resolve it. I have my view, you have yours, and that's okay. 
we don't have to agree in the end. Maybe the, 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 the value is in the debate. The value is in the conversation itself. I think that. That's what I think. I believe that having a debate is better than not having it, even if the outcome is completely the same as where we started. That's fine. We had the debate. Now I have more context, more information. It seems we have different views on climate change policies. Let's agree to disagree on the best approach to take. Okay, which basically means I have my opinion, you have yours. This is where we keep talking in circles, perhaps. So sometimes you're in a discussion and you have two very strong opinions and nobody's really moving or budging on their opinions. There's a gridlock situation happening, right? So there, we agree to disagree because we're in this loop of repetitive arguments. We're not getting anywhere. We are going in circles. So let's just agree to disagree. I'm hungry. I want to get a slice of cheesecake. I'm tired of this conversation. Let's agree to disagree because of cheesecake. Okay, last one. It's important to keep an open mind about. It's important we keep an open mind uh, about alternative medicine as there could be benefits we're unaware of, right? Now, if you wanted to really stress that this is an opinion, you could say, I believe it's important. And if you want to say, instead of we keep an open mind, you could say to. It's important to keep an open mind. I believe it's important to keep an open mind. This could avoid causing someone to feel that you're f trying to force them into something, right? You should keep an open mind about that. People don't really like to be talked to in that way. I think people don't really like when other people try to force an opinion on them in that way. You should, right? So I believe it's important to keep an open mind about alternative medicine would be a good way to say that I think it's important, but then just say that it's me. I've expressed what I wanted to say, but I'm not really pushing that on you, okay? So these are the ways that we can have respectful debates. We can really disagree with people. We can agree with people. We can add context. We can get more information. There are a lot more that we didn't talk about. I would encourage you to explore all of the possible variations of the phrases we looked at. If you have any questions about any of the things we talked about, then put those in the comments. If you haven't done so already, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe and get a free course in the links in the description. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. Thermos I will try, says SJ. Okay, fantastic. 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 Have you heard about what's going on with Gemini? This is something that's happened in the last week or so. So Gemini, if you don't know, is Google's competitor to ChatGPT, OpenAI's uh, LLM chatbot running on GPT-4. I have a couple of courses on ChatGPT if you want to check those out. But my course on English learning with ChatGPT also includes some lessons using BARD, which looks like this. It's the same thing with a different brain behind it. They got rid of the name Bard. Thank goodness, what a silly name. And anyway, the thing that they the thing that they discovered was they had they made an effort to and I don't know how it happened, but in an effort to be more inclusive, to have more ethnic uh, diversity, um, to represent more people, right? They they may have gone a little too far. So that this is, by the way, for images. So in, inside of ChatGPT, OpenAI has DALI. Well, Gemini also does images. And there were people posting pictures of historical things or 
uh, cultural things and getting back results that were kind of silly, like give me a picture of George Washington and it comes back and George Washington is black. <laughs> <laughs> they paid for the sake of of uh, of diversity. So for his then now there's a debate about historical accuracy, right? Well, uh, diversity is great, but you also want to, when you're creating an image, have a historically accurate result. George Washington was a, a white guy, uh, and so so if you're creating a picture of George Washington, then to be accurate, he should be a white guy, right? Just as if you were creating a picture of LeBron James and you wouldn't want a white guy you'd want a black guy a black guy because LeBron is black right actually I don't think you could do LeBron because he's a public figure and he's still alive and I think they have rules against doing public figures who are living but you could do George Washington I think because he's not and so I think that's how that works um, I'm curious I've never actually tried this I want to see I wonder if they fixed it I want uh, to see an image of George Washington uh, giving a speech to a, a group of, yeah, let's just say giving a speech. I don't want to actually add anything that makes it more, uh, that maybe confuses it. So let's just see if we can get a historically accurate George Washington. All right. Okay. But that's okay, that's just a that's just an actual painting from Wikipedia. I want I want a generated image. No, 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 no. I want a uh, a portrait image generated of George Washington Oh, I think maybe I have to add something fake so that it says, oh, this needs to be generated. George Washington um, using a MacBook Pro. Okay, let's see if we can get this one. Come on. We are working to improve Gemini's ability to generate images of people. We expect this feature to return soon. Oh, okay, so they've taken away the feature. Oh, can it gem generate any images? Uh, generate an image of a penguin using a MacBook Pro. Let's see what we get. Okay, okay, so we got a penguin using a MacBook Pro different styles that's that's not too bad uh, but I can't get any people create an image of Michael Jordan using a MacBook Pro so I don't think it's going to give anything yeah, so anything that's anything that includes people, it looks like Gemini's not gonna do. And anything that includes anything else, it will do. Uh, generate an abstract image that includes snails and frisbees. Let's see what we get here. Let's see what we get. Okay, we got. I feel like that one, the second one is good. That's kind of abstract and it's got frisbees, although there aren't. I guess the swirls are from, or the snail swirls, right? Um, not great, but not too bad. ChatGPT is definitely better at doing generative images. Let's see if we use ChatGPT here. Um, oh, I copied the wrong thing. I copied the wrong thing. Let's use this one here. Okay. Let's 
see if we can get a good one. Generating an image of an abstract image that includes snails and frisbees. All right. Hey, that's pretty good. ChatGPT. Well, this is actually Dolly, but that's that's way better. That's way better. All right, now let's give it the old Washington MacBook test, and then we'll do Michael Jordan. I don't think it'll do Michael Jordan again because I think even ChatGPT is unwilling to do actual living people, right? I want a portrait image generated of George Washington using a MacBook Pro. All right, let's do that. Okay, I don't need generated. I just need... All right. Oops. Here we go. George Washington using a MacBook Pro. Here we go. Come on. Don't disappoint me. Don't disappoint me, Dolly. Don't disappoint me, Dolly, please. A little slow, huh? Here we go. <laughs> Pretty good. I mean, I would say he's a little young. I guess it's the young George Washington. The wig looks good. The, he's His outfit is looking very fly. Uh, that looks like a 20... Oh, that looks like a MacBook Air, though. Um, but that's not too bad. All right. Now, now I want an image of Michael Jordan using a MacBook Pro. And this one I think it will not do. Here is the portrait image you requested requested featuring a figure resembling George Washington using a MacBook Pro, blending historical elements with modern technology. Look at those boots. Look at those boots. Those are some nice riding boots. I sometimes wish that it was the norm because, you know, women's fashion is so interesting, so varied and diverse. As a man, the norms around clothes are kind of are kind of limited, which is fine. But it would be cool if everything stayed cool in the past that had been cool. And so instead of fashion changing, you just added fashion, right? So it would still be totally normal and cool for men to wear whatever he's got on. And, uh, you know, riding boots and high collar shirts and frilly stuff, right? Because if you wear that today, you, it's, it's an effort because it's hard to find. You have to get it tailored. But then it's really just people looking at you because you're wearing weird clothes. And so you, you pay the cost of being um, gaining too much attention that you might not be comfortable with. Okay, that looks nothing like Michael Jordan in my opinion. And what is up with his arms? That is bizarre. That looks nothing like Michael Jordan. Here's an image of a person inspired by the physique and poise of a basketball player. No. That's unbelievable. That is bizarre. That is very strange. Those muscles, those muscles are too big. Those don't look like human muscles. <laughs> okay. I'm going to call that a fail. I'm going to call that a fail. Okay. Let's move on. Let's move on, shall we? Enough of this. What's next? Oh, I know what I was going to do. I was going to see if we could do a debate with... Ch I remember now why I was on ChatGPT. All right. Where we're going to... I was going to do a debate with ChatGPT. So let me give, bear with me for just a moment as I, let me uh, pop this on here. I'm just going to uh, open my phone app here, my ChatGPT app, and I'm going to um, 
share my screen so that I can see this. And we're going to test it out. That's not what I want to do. That's not what I want to do. That's not what I want to do. Hold on. Hey, let me share my screen, guys. Hang tight, hang tight. Okay. No. No. Okay, I don't know if my, my screen sharing might not be working. Hey, Mary McCain is here. Wow, cool. Amazing. How you doing? Mary, I'm going to answer your question in the group chat, but I it's going to it was one of those questions that's a bigger question and I don't want to just give a quick reply. So, I apologize for the delay, but I want to give it the due time to actually go through a few specific points. I haven't had time to do that yet, but I will. I surely will. I love I love when my technology betrays me when I'm live, you know? It's a wonderful thing. Let's try one more thing. Oh, I know what it is. I think. I, my VPN is messing up. I'm trying to connect my computer to my phone, just so you know. For context, that's what I'm doing, guys. That's what I'm doing. I'm going to try one more thing, and if it doesn't work, I give up. No, it didn't work. All right. We give up? Actually, we can try it without it, right? I can try it without it, I think. Let's try it without it. Without actually speaking. Okay, so. One thing I like to do is use ChatGPT as a debate partner. When I'm trying to work through a difficult idea or I'm trying to practice explaining my thoughts about something, right? It can be a great way to uh, it can be a great way to number 1 have somebody push back against you, but also have a format to just talk about what you think, to refine your ideas. And so we're just going to try this very simply. We could do this as a live conversation, but we're just going to try this as a simple text conversation for now so that we can see everything. So we'll start with a prompt. Let me paste in the prompt. What you want to do is be very, very clear about what you're trying to accomplish with, um, with your prompt. So here's what I'm going to use. I want you to take on the role of a challenging debate partner. The debate should be interactive. Each of us will share our views in a persuasive way, asking uh, challenging questions and poking holes in the other person's arguments. We will debate the topic of whether students uh, should be able to use generative AI to study and do their homework. My position, students should be able to use generative AI. Your position, S students should not be able to use generative AI. <laughs> the irony. Oh, the irony of that. I'm forcing ChatGPT. Uh, oh, I have a typo here. I am forcing ChatGPT to <laughs> make the argument that it should not be used. <laughs> 
Uh, okay, so wait for me to say let's begin before starting this debate. If you understand, say I understand. So what, what we should see is I understand. Okay? All right. Now, if I were doing this on the app, what I would do is now open up the app and actually, you know what? Maybe I can still do it on the app. I would go to, on my on my app, I would go to that chat where I had started that conversation. And it's called Debate Students. And I would then start a conversation, right? And have the debate. So let's do that. Why don't we do that? Here we go. I'm just doing this on my phone, but but hopefully we'll see it here on the uh, on the screen here in text. Okay. So starting the conversation. Let's begin. All right. Let's jump into the debate. I'll start by laying out my stance against the use of generative AI for studying and doing homework. The primary concern with students using generative AI tools for educational purposes is the potential for these technologies to hinder the development of critical thinking and problem solving skills. Education isn't just about finding answers. It's about understanding the processes and methods needed to arrive at those answers. Moreover, the use of generative AI for academic tasks can raise ethical concerns, particularly around academic integrity. It blurs the lines between the student's own work and the work produced by AI, potentially leading to issues with plagiarism and originality. Schools and universities value the development of individual thought and the ability to articulate one's ideas, both of which could be compromised when students lean too heavily on AI tools. While I think you do have some really good points, the use of generative AI is a paradigm shift in the way that people work and study. And so not allowing students to use these tools, to learn how to use these tools, is equivalent to not allowing students to use computers in some sense. We have to let students learn the most cutting edge tools. And when they learn these tools, when they learn how to use them, they will find new ways to be creative, new ways to solve problems, things that we can't even imagine now. So we have to allow technology to progress and we have to allow students to be part of that progression. You bring up an interesting perspective by comparing the integration of generative AI into education with the adoption of computers. It's undeniable that technology evolves, and with it, the tools we use in education must also evolve. However, the key difference with generative AI lies in its potential to not just augment, but to replace the learning process in ways that computers did not. Computers have been tools that aid learning, enabling access to information, facilitating the creation of work, and enhancing communication yet they have largely required direct human input and decision-making to produce outputs. Generative AI, on the other hand, has the capacity to generate outputs based on inputs with minimal human intervention, which raises a critical question. Are we teaching students to leverage technology as a tool, or are we allowing technology to take over the learning process? Adopting cutting-edge tools in education is important, but it's equally important to ensure that these tools are integrated in ways that enhance educational outcomes without compromising the development of fundamental skills. The creativity and problem solving abilities you mentioned are crucial. However, they should be developed not just in using the tools, but also in understanding the underlying concepts that these tools are applied to. In light of this, how can we ensure that the use of generative AI in education enhances rather than replaces the learning process? How do we maintain a balance between leveraging the capabilities of AI 
and ensuring that students are not overly reliant on it, thereby preserving academic integrity and the development of critical thinking and problem solving skills. I think that you have an excellent point in the idea that we would not completely rely on generative AI and AI tools as part of the learning process because that could actually prevent some learning or some types of learning from happening. That said, I think that there is still room in education for generative AI. Maybe, for example, there are classes that teach the fundamentals of writing, and part of that class requires writing an original essay that does not use these tools. And there has to be a way to make sure that doesn't happen. I see value in that, so I think you have a good point. But I still think that it would be important to include some lessons, some classes that rely heavily on generative AI because only then can we figure out new ways to use it. Only then can we discover all of the possible applications that generative AI has. Again, I go back to the computer example. It's by playing with computers partly in school, but when we're young that we learn how to build cool applications, that we get excited about coding. It's by using generative AI that we think of doing something we never would have thought of, that we find some kind of application that nobody has ever thought of. So I think there's really a way to balance these in education, and it's not a black and white issue. Your point about incorporating generative AI into the curriculum in a balanced and thoughtful manner is well taken. <laughs> it's clear that completely sidelining such a powerful tool from the educational process could mean missing out on opportunities for innovation and learning. The yeah. idea of integrating generative AI into certain aspects of education while also maintaining traditional methods of teaching fundamental skills is a compelling approach. It acknowledges the value of these tools without undermining the importance of foundational learning processes. Perhaps the solution lies in a hybrid model where generative AI is used to complement and enhance the learning experience rather than replace traditional learning methods. For example, generative AI could be used to provide personalized learning experiences, generate creative prompts for brainstorming sessions, or offer simulations that allow students to explore complex concepts in a more interactive and engaging way. Yeah, Meanwhile, yeah, yeah. traditional assessments and projects can ensure that students are also developing their abilities to think critically, solve problems, and create Amen. original works without undue reliance Heck on yes. AI. For sure. Incorporating ethical considerations and critical thinking about yeah. technology itself into the curriculum could also be invaluable. By teaching students not only how to use generative AI, but also to understand its implications, limitations, and potential biases, we can prepare them to be not just consumers of technology, but also thoughtful critics and innovators. With this approach, the educational system can embrace the benefits of generative AI while also safeguarding against its potential downsides. Would you say that finding the right balance where generative AI is seen as one of many tools in the educational toolkit could address the concerns around its use in education? How might we structure such an educational model to ensure that students are gaining the full spectrum of skills needed for the future? I think we solved it. I mean, together, we just did it. All they need to do is read this chat history, and that's it. Game over. We have solved education in the 21st century. Nice teamwork. Thank you so much. Well done. Bye-bye. All right. There we go. So that was pretty interesting. You know, th this is something, by the way, I do pretty often where I, I do it less with debate and more often with uh, an idea that I have or maybe my comprehension of something that I'm reading. But I often have these sort of long back and forth conversations as a way to push myself to explain stuff that's in my head. Just now in that conversation, I had to 
come to grips with this idea that yes, there is still a place for traditional skills, traditional writing skills. That's I'm glad I have those and I want people to continue to learn those. And so you get something new, there's a back and forth. You have to really tune the prompt so that it's useful to you because maybe you don't want explanations as long as ChatGPT was using. Well, in the prompt then you would say give short concise arguments explaining your viewpoint and always finish with a question that I can answer, something like that. But there are a lot of ways to structure this, not only using this for debate, but having these live conversations. It really pushes you to use your language skills, to practice organizing your thoughts, to express yourself more clearly, and in the case of a debate, to figure out how to be more persuasive in the moment. Very cool. Again, I use this all the time. If you try it out, let me know how it goes. If you haven't done so already, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe and get a free course in the links in the description. All right. All righty then. Um. That was that was really interesting. I, I thought it was very interesting. I you know what I should have specified for everyone to use simple language. There were definitely some big words in there. I'm sure not everybody knows. So I'm sorry about that, but very cool. Very cool. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. I think is cool. Uh okay. All right. Are you not afraid that soon artificial intelligence will take over foreign language learning and we don't need teachers anymore? Um, I'm not particularly afraid of it. No, no, I'm not. Um, in fact, I'm in favor of teaching people how to use language tools. I have a course and that course is called, uh, that course is called, let's see, let me find it. How to achieve English fluency with ChatGPT. The course is currently not on sale, but oh, maybe it is. If you're a new learner, it's on sale. Let's see, let me show you what it looks like here. Okay, so this is the course. It's my course. Um, the course covers, it's 6.5 hours. It covers learning English with AI, practicing English with AI tools, uh, feedback and assessments. It's really pretty in depth. I mean, what we did today is just a simple sort of simple thing. Uh, that's a pretty in-depth way to uh, to practice um, and to learn English and improve your English with tools like ChatGPT. Uh, I I believe that um, I mean if I'm if I'm re replaced as a teacher, I'm replaced. Fine, whatever. Uh, I think everyone is at risk of being replaced. There's no one who's, nobody's safe except for maybe a plumber who, who has to do complex things with their hands, right? Uh, ironically, <laughs> we thought blue collar would be replaced first. And it's actually people who work in digital space. But I, I don't know, I see it kind of differently. I think from my point of view, Anybody can learn anything on YouTube. Anybody can learn anything in books. Anybody can learn anything anywhere. And it's more about where you want to get your information from. So why do I watch podcasts or listen to podcasts? What is it about them? Is it, about, it, it Part of it is the information I get, but it's also the people I want to hear from these people, specifically from these people. I could consume the information elsewhere. I could read what they're saying 
in other words elsewhere, but I often want to follow a person's way of doing things, a specific person. I do think human beings are naturally inclined toward wanting to hear things from other human beings. I think that's part of human nature. I, I do. Because I that's what I want. Um, maybe that's not true. Maybe that's not right. I think it's I think that's right. And um, I think on the point of language learning, will language learning end when we can just translate speaking our own languages? I also don't think so. I think there I think there's always room to uh, not just translate your thoughts to someone else, but to actually learn another language is to learn another culture, is to learn another way of thinking, right? I'm raising my son to learn both Chinese and English. I don't think that when he's 10 years old, he will need to know Chinese to function. I think, you know, AI translation will be so good that you know, we'll be able to just implant chips in our brains that translate automatically. But I still want him to grow up with both languages because I want him to be that kind of person. I want him to develop language skills on both sides. I want him to understand his mother's culture. I want him to understand uh, how to use language in live situations and have that mental flexibility. That's what I want, and so um, I don't. I don't. I think there's more to it than utility. I think there's more to it than. Um, I think there's more to it than what we get, and I think as AI becomes more of a more powerful over time and solves all of these problems, then our what we want then because we just get anything that we need anytime very easily learn anything get anything consume anything have anything it's going to be easier and easier and easier to get whatever you want very easily uh, with much less effort and perhaps much less cost even especially if it's information right and so where do we spend our time then well what we want maybe is to be entertained what we want is to have our brains stimulated in a new way. What we want is a different kind of experience. What we want are more of these qualitative things rather than the quantitative information. The information is just baseline, background, default. So what do I want? Well, I want to be inspired. I want to hear something that I never expected to hear. I want to be a better person in a way that I can't define exactly. So my hope is that AI, as it gets better and better, allows more and more. This is called self-actualization in Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You have these levels. The hierarchy of needs um, starts with you know basic things like food and sex and ur biological urges. And then at the top, you have self-actualization, which is finding your sense of meaning in life, um, exploring your personality, getting to know yourself, being a better person, understanding your unconscious, um, all of you know all of these things that are part of spiritual development, all of that stuff is is I think where hopefully more of us will be able to live, because we'll no longer be struggling with the lower levels of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. That's the dream of AI, I think. That's the ultimate dream, right? Do you have any courses on how to teach ESL students? The reason I ask is because I would love to be a teacher. Uh, I will. I have one planned. I am planning a course on how to teach ESL students. I actually paused the development of that course because of all of these AI tools. I wanted to make sure that when I do, I include how to integrate those tools into teaching ESL because uh, the, the landscape has changed dramatically. And so I want to make sure that, that it's actually got the stuff that people actually need. Anyway, you know what? I think we're going to call it a day today. I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. I'm not thirsty. I am hungry, though. 
it's time to go home and play with my son and maybe uh, eat some food. So I hope you have a great day. I hope you have a fantastic week. I hope you have a fantastic year. Good luck learning whatever you're learning, doing whatever you're doing. And if you have any questions, make sure to drop those in the comments or you can find me on Discord. And again, if you haven't already done so, um, you can check out the courses on the website. You can get a, a yearly membership, but pay monthly at 30% off. It's a pretty good deal. Check out the ChatGPT course if you want. That one's not on the website. That one's on Udemy, so grab that one there. Um, listen if you're watching. You can do that in the links in the description. Watch if you're listening. You can do that in the links in the description. So, uh, again, have a great one. Take care. Stay safe. And I'll see you in the next one.